us today on Around the Peninsula. I'm Maria Sorreo. We are here today at the PD Golf Club to learn more about the upside of aging. Well, we have two guests. They have a moderated conversation. Helen Dennis, she's a local celebrity in the South Bay area. She's a nationally syndicated columnist. She is an expert in aging, and she is also a member of the Palos Verdes Peninsula Village. She invited Rabbi Laura Geller, who is a pioneering rabbi. She's one of the first women rabbis in the United States. She wrote a book, or excuse me, co-authored a book called Getting Good at Getting Older. She'll be speaking about her book, about her experiences. And she also is one of the leading national figures in, in aging. She was named um, a top 50 thought leader by PBS in 2017. So it'll be a great conversation. Well, thank you, Laura. I want you to look around. This is absolutely phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. You know, it's been wonderful to see each other in a square. But there is nothing like seeing each other in person. I have a question. How, for how many people is this the first time you've come to the Upside of Aging event? Just raise your hand. First time. Wow. And how many are troopers? This is not your first time. Okay. These are our sustainers. Well, this is, this is wonderful that we can have so many newcomers and also those that have been around for a while. So, I want to start a little bit with Rabbi Geller and talk about firsts. So, your biography has a lot of firsts, and let me go through some of them. You were the first female rabbi on the West Coast. You were the first female rabbi Hillel director in the country. You created the first... Tech support. Tech support. Tech support, here we go. Tech support happened from the ethers. Um, you are the first female rabbi to lead a major metropolitan congregation. That's Temple Emmanuel. You were selected by a national search committee. You created the first synagogue village. You're the third female rabbi ordained in the reform movement. You're the fourth female rabbi ordained in the country. And you were the only woman among 50 first year rabbinical students in Jerusalem. As an aside, what was that like? So first, before I answer these questions, um, it really is an honor to be here, uh, sitting with my friend for Helen Dennis is always an honor. I also want to acknowledge that this is a tough time right now in the world um, for all of us. Um, uh, as a rabbi, I often. As a rabbi, I often look to the sources of learning in my tradition to find solace when times are tough. I think about the Book of Psalms, a book that means something to many of us. I know that uh, some of you are Jewish, some of you are Christian, some of you are Muslim, some of you are um, not members in the faith community. Um, and it's important to acknowledge that this is a tough time for all of us. I look to the book of Psalms. There's a verse that says, from a narrow place, I reach out. I long for the expansiveness of optimism. This is a narrow place. And all of us are reaching out in our own way to make sense out of what's happening in the world. I also want to acknowledge that getting older is also a narrow place for a lot of us. And part of the work that all of us are doing simply by being here right now is to acknowledge that we are wanting to turn the narrow place of growing older into an expansive <coughs> place of opportunity, of challenge, and of joy. So with that as a starting point, now I'll answer your questions. <laughs> so what was it like to be the first? Part of it is just a matter of timing. 
I um, was interested in learning more about what it meant to be Jewish right at the same time that the Hebrew Union College, the Reform Seminary, the Liberal Seminary, was looking for smart women who didn't know anything about being Jewish, and that was me. <laughs> I grew up in a Jewish family, and Jewishness was part of who I was, but I never really examined it until I went to college in the late 60s, identity politics, everybody was trying to figure out who they were in the world and what their identities meant. I was one of them. And so I went to rabbinical school to learn to what it meant to me to be Jewish. And it happened to be exactly the right time. So I was the first woman in my class, me and 49 lovely guys who had no idea what I was doing there. Was I looking to find a husband, or was I looking to prove that women could be a rabbi, or was I simply like them, trying to figure out what their Jewishness meant to them? And then I was ordained in 1976, as Helen said, the third in the Reform Movement. And um, I just was at the place where people wanted to have a woman sitting in a room because people were starting to recognize that at least half of the Jewish community was women and they needed to be represented. So long before I should have been, I was the one invited, the token person invited to all kinds of meetings and programs and projects, and uh, it turned out that it was a wonderful opportunity for me. And I just sort of ran with it and enjoyed it and um, am grateful for the opportunities that the timing presented to me. So thank you. Um, this is a question where I really know the answer, but I have to ask you. How did you get involved in the field of thinking? Okay, so the reason that Helen knows the answer to this question is because she is the reason. <laughs> so it turns out that when you're in your middle 50s and you're a congregational rabbi, you begin to think about matters of retirement. And there is a seminar that the Reform Movement provides for clergy called the Retirement Seminar, right? Is that what it's called? Anyway, mostly it's about finances, to make sure you have enough money to continue a reasonable lifestyle. But some years ago, um, the leadership recognized that there is a psychological and a spiritual dimension to retirement. And we need to think about that as well. What are you going to do when you're no longer the rabbi of your synagogue? So Helen was the one who taught that part of the class. So I go to New York, I'm in my late 50s, <coughs> beginning to think about retirement, you know, it was at least 10 years away, and I meet Helen, and for the first time, I begin to recognize that I need to pay attention to what growing older is going to mean to me psychologically and spiritually. And that was the beginning of how I got into this thinking about growing older. Meanwhile, at my congregation, a large, um, you know, pretty well-known congregation in Beverly Hills, I noticed that the, um, a huge number of baby boomers were leaving the congregation. Their children had grown up, they were no longer in our religious school, and people felt that the synagogue wasn't taking, paying attention to their needs. And I wanted to understand why that was. And so with the help of some wonderful leaders, we organized a listening campaign where we talked to about 250 folks in the congregation who were in this stage, this new stage of life that didn't used to exist. The stage between raising our families and building our careers, and frail old age. It turns out what's new for us that wasn't true for our grandparents or great-grandparents is that we're going to live 31 years longer than our great-grandparents great did, but not 31 years longer tapped on to the end of our life. It's not that we're going to be frail for 31 years. 
It's that in between this stage of building our careers, and for those of us that might end up in frail old age, not all of us will, what are we going to do with that new stage? And we asked folks in this cohort, these 250 congregants, how do they think about this stage? What keeps them up in the morning? What gets them up in the morning? What keeps them up at night? And we discovered by listening that people had four fears. The first was they would become invisible. Who am I when I'm no longer the senior rabbi of Temple Emanuel Beverly Hills? Right? Who am I? The second fear, who are my friends? We notice as we grow older, some of you might have noticed this as well, that our social capital begins to shrink. People that used to return our calls right away, you get emails right away, you know, who, I'm afraid that I'm going to be isolated. The third fear was, well, what am I going to do all day? What is my purpose? And the fourth fear were fears people had about people they loved who were grown older. So we began to think about this, talk about this, begin to build programs to help people explore these kinds of questions. And that led to the writing of a book with my late husband called Getting Good at Getting Older. And that is how I got into this whole universe. And the thing that's important to know is that it is very personal. This is not some objective issue out there in the world. This is really about me and about people I love, and it is important. So in your process of developing High Village LA, were there any surprises? So High Village LA is a synagogue village. It's different from the Palace Verdes village, in that the Palace Verdes village, as I understand it, you drew a big circle around the four cities that are part of this community and invited anybody who wants to participate to participate. I was the rabbi of the synagogue. Down the street was a friend of mine who was the rabbi of the synagogue, and we we're both having the challenges of keeping these active older adults in the synagogue. So we decided to create a community for active older adults within our synagogue. And then in order to join our village, we needed to be a member of the synagogue. So let me step back. One of the things that emerged in the listening campaign is that a major question that people asked was, with whom do I want to grow older? Where do I want to live? Do I want to move to where my kids are? Do I want to move to a retirement facility? Do I want to sell my house, buy an RV, and drive around the country with a, uh, with a bumper sticker that says, I'm spending my children's inheritance? <laughs> They are, you know, I want to move to Portugal, I mean, or to Costa Rica. And you all know people that are doing some of those very same things. It turns out that in my congregation, and frankly, in the country, the majority of people want to stay in their own homes. But in order to stay in your home, you need to make changes in your community. I can stay in my house for as long as I can stand on the ladder and change a light bulb. When I can't do that anymore, I can't stay in my house, unless there's a neighbor or a volunteer who can come in and change that light bulb. So the notion of with whom do I want to grow old, I want to stay in my own house, is what leads to a village and what leads to what led to Chai Village Ale. So what surprised me about it is I thought that people would join our village. These were members of our synagogue who at the time were late 50s, early 60s, that people would want to join the village primarily because they would want to provide services for other people, drive them to the doctor, change their light bulb, or because they wanted to receive services, right? I need help. 
It turns out that people joined the village because they wanted more friends. And that was a complete shock. Who could imagine that I, who didn't have time to go to the bathroom as, in my job as a full-time congregational rabbi, would ever come to a time when my friendship network would begin to constrict enough that I would need to join, make new friends. And that was the biggest surprise. High Village, like the Palos Verdes Village, is a robust community of people who are looking for connections with other people. Helping each other, yes. Receiving help, that's actually a little bit of a problem. Many of us are very good about offering to provide help, but we're not so good at asking for help when we need it. And that's an important thing for us to begin to recognize that it's okay to say, I need some help here. So that was a surprise too. But the real surprise was how much people want new friends and want to figure out how to deal with friendship. You know, here I am, 73 years old. I know that I have less time ahead than I have behind. And I want to look at my friends and I want to only be friends with people who bring me joy and meaning and and I want to figure out a way to let go of toxic friendships and how do you do that? And it's not so easy. And at my age, how do I make new friends? These were the things that surprised me, and these are the ways in which the village has been really life affirming and in some ways, particularly during the pandemic, life saving because of the connections that were made through the village. Thank you. We know loneliness and isolation are real issues, not, all, not only for older adults, but also for young people. Do you have a vision of the potential of a, of a village in other faith communities, in other communities, if you had the pie in the sky? How could you envision the expansion of the village concept? First of all, it's important to know that the village movement nationally that started in uh, 2001 in Boston in a neighborhood called Beacon Hill, which was a pretty upscale neighborhood, when neighbors decided they were on their own, they wanted to stay there, they had to make changes. So they all got together, and it was sort of like a homeowners association on steroids. You know, they paid money, hired a professional to help organize them, and um, you know, it made a huge difference and such a huge difference that people around the country started to hear about it and started to call. And eventually it became too much for the Beacon Hill Village to deal with. So a nonprofit called Village to Village Network was born out of some funding initiative from somebody or other. There are now about 200 villages around the country. There are 200 more in formation. Here in California, there's a group called Village Movement California. There are 60 villages in California, and 40 of them are part of this network called Village Movement California. And then there's this national movement, Village to Village Network. There is also um, lots of studies now, particularly done at Berkeley and also at the University of Chicago, that people that are members of villages have higher rates of happiness less recidivism in hospitals, um, you know, all kinds of actual measurable changes that happen when you're connected to a village. So knowing that, the idea of creating different kinds of villages, the kind that you have here, which is a neighborhood village, or that we have in Los Angeles, which is connected to a synagogue, I have this fantasy that wouldn't it be cool somewhere in the country that a synagogue and a church form a village together. What kind of blessings would come from that? And I have um, this notion that we, as active older adults who vote, can be organized to actually make a difference in the way the United States thinks about growing older. And how could we use the, the um, connection? And there are a lot of people around the country who are taking all of this very seriously how does that change the way we think about growing older? Listen, some of you, I look at you and I see that you're my age, you probably had some of the same kinds of experiences that I did when you were in college. You know, we were the people that changed the world. Why? Because we were part of a movement. 
the anti-war movement, the women's movement, the civil rights movement, the movements that really shaped our lives and changed the world. Well, we are in a movement now. And the movement is changing the truth of ageism and the way that we are not seen and, and our needs are not taken care of. And even more than that, internalized ageism. I mean, the fact that ageism is real, is real. But the real problem is that many of us have internalized those negative stereotypes of growing older, and that we think negatively about the next stage of our life. If we can't change the way we think about growing older, how can we be part of a movement that is going to change the way the country thinks about growing older? So, for example, our governor has a, um, a master plan about growing older, and the village movement is part of educating the folks that are planning that so that they can pay attention to the needs of adult, of adults. And another part of the fantasy is it turns out that things that are good for me as an active older adult are also pretty good for my daughter and son-in-law with their little kid. Um, I'm going to the airport later today and there's a long walk between <laughs> when you uh, check your bag and when you finally get on the airplane. Well, when you have a little kid, it's also a long walk. Whoever designed LAX was not thinking about me. Um, and not thinking about my daughter. And when you think about parks, when you think about uh, ramps, um, you know, it's hard for me as I get older to step up, uh, you know, when I'm walking on the street. And if you're in a wheelchair, or if you're pushing a baby carriage, it's also hard. So if we take ourselves seriously as a movement and begin to advocate for changes in everything, in the way social services are created, in the way our parks are created, our airports, our schools, um, I'm sort of going beyond your question, but <laughs> You know, you think about universities, right? I went to college, I was 18, I graduated when I was, what, 21 or 22. Um, there's a lot I would do different now, differently now. I want to go back to college. I actually have the time, I have the intellect, I want to find programs that I, why should university education only be geared towards younger people? And it turns out that there's some people around the country that are imagining different kinds of programs where folks like me either move back to a college community where I live in a community with younger people and older people and I get to be a student, or the kinds of programs that you can take now at UCLA or at USC or I suspect here as well, you know, that lifelong learning is a part of maintaining purpose and engagement in the world. So think about all the things that shape our lives. How would they be different if we could look at them through a lens that really included us? We're visible, we matter, and it also turns out that some of us actually have resources <laughs> that could be utilized in um, the kinds of nonprofit activities that many of us care about. Some of you are volunteers at organizations, and I know that it gives purpose. We need to teach organizations how to use our talent, right? I don't want to stuff envelopes. I want my experience, my expertise to be used in a way that really values me and can make a difference in an organization, or in the life of a child, or whatever. So all of this is part of my fantasy. The other part that I think is important, and I believe is the shiny new thing, is not just paying attention to growing older, but it's actually co-generation. It is generations working together to make a difference in the world. One of the things you hear a lot is that there's tension between um, millennials and, and us, you know, between kids and canes. Is how it's kind of and, and, and during the beginning of the pandemic, when some people were saying, well, you know, it doesn't matter if COVID kills older people, right? We have to be concerned about 
you know, we know that that kind of rhetoric is out there in the world, but it turns out it's not really true. It turns out that younger people, particularly millennials, as Helen said, experience a lot of loneliness, and they want connections with us. People like us want connections with younger people. The world, as I said at the beginning, is in a terrible shape right now. No one generation can fix this alone. What would happen if we imagined older folks and younger folks working together? Working together to make the world better. And along the way, we get to know each other. So one of the things that's actually being discussed now is thinking about national service. Many of you have heard of AmeriCorps. AmeriCorps used to be VISTA. It's a program where um, younger people can volunteer. But when you're 35, you are aged out. Turns out that there's a program called Senior AmeriCorps, which begins when you're 55. In some places around the country, AmeriCorps and Senior Corps are working on the same issues in the same building, but have nothing to do with each other. What would happen if all of those kinds of efforts were understood as co-generational? Younger folks and older folks working together, me going back to university, living in a setting where I'm not just living in a village where there are all, you know, in, 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 one of my hopes someday is that our village in, um, in Los Angeles, the high village jelly, is not just for people that are 60 and older, but you know, the young folks in the congregation the single moms who need some, you know, surrogate grandmother to babysit their kids. Why can't we create those kinds of intergenerational nurturing communities? That's all part of my fantasy and my vision. Now we know why Robert got Robert got a seventy first in her book. Um, yeah, there's some who say that if we had more intergenerational connection, there would be no ageism, because the generations would know each other on a personal level. And your other point, older people are the most underutilized resource in America. And it's not one that will diminish. And the challenge is how to get society, per se, to acknowledge that. Um, I'm making an assumption. So much of what we see that bothers us can be ageism. Um, the airport was not designed for people in our life stage. Now, this is a real far-fetched. I don't know if any of you have seen The Golden Bachelor. <laughs> highly intellectual pursuit, <laughs> but who could not watch it because older people are going to get married and have sex and how, how attractive is that? So this is a very cynical um, aspect, and then we'll get back to our online conversation. Um, television has, is in trouble because there are not as many viewers. But it means less revenue because the advertisers aren't there. So my cynical view is, when all else fails, go to the old people. Okay? That's of the last resort. That's a little bit of built-in ageism. So we'll see how this golden, golden bachelor uh, evolves. I'm waiting for the golden bachelorette. <laughs> but I have aged out. They're not kind of tight. I'm not disappointed, <laughs> but they get you. On the other hand, I think we have a lot to feel optimistic about. I mean, I just heard that Meg Ryan has a new film, you know, and the truth is, Jane Fonda, bless her heart, is still, you know, incredibly active. Um, you know, the, the images of um, older people in TV shows and in, um, you know, Gracie and... Uh, Frankly, Gracie, I loved it. You know, th there are different um, images that are now being projected, and I think that that's an important 
change in what's going on. There's still those horrible Hallmark cards. Um, you know, there are three stages of life. Childhood, midlife, and you look good. <laughs> um, you know, what if we stop buying those cards? Just a simple thing like that. But, but I do think that we have, you know, things are um, not as bad as they used to be. We're not quite as invisible as we once were, and I think that that's important. And Helen just said, I just want to give you the numbers for a little bit. By 2030, as the last baby boomers turn 65, older adults are expected to reach 20% of the population. Talking about North America. Older adults are projected to outnumber children under 18 for the first time in the United States history by 2034. One fifth of the total U.S. population, about 88 million people, will be 65 and older by 2050. We are a huge cohort, and if we took ourselves seriously, we can make a huge difference. I agree, and I completely agree with you that the images are changing, and we see changes in television. I, I also want to add, we have a long way to go. We have a long way to go. And my sense is, each one of us here is an advocate to change how aging is being perceived, not only ourselves, but how others see us. This is the worst time to have laryngitis, so. <laughs> but it's there. Um, actually, actually, the Jewish high holidays for a rabbi are the worst time. <laughs> <laughs> You've got this one. <laughs> um, two, two, other things I want to talk about, and that's language. We have a very hard time what to call older people. So you have consistently used the term elder. Why that choice? I actually don't use the term elder. <laughs> I wish that I could use the term elder, because in many spiritual traditions, you aspire to become an elder. In Jewish tradition, at least theoretically, to be an elder is a good thing. In Japanese culture, to be an elder. In indigenous, in indigenous um, American culture, to be an elder is something that one aspires to. Somehow, the the word elder has become identified with the word elderly. And so you think of it as connected to frail old age. I would love to be able to recapture all the power in the idea that I have wisdom. It isn't that being older makes me wise, but to the extent that I am able to be reflective about my life experience and understand the resilience that comes from reaching 73, that I have a lot of wisdom, and I want to be acknowledged for that. So in a religious language, that's what the word elder means. But frankly, it doesn't work because people don't like it. Senior, that used to be the word. And all of us, in the days when we used to go to movies, some of us are starting to go back to the movies. You know, the senior discounts, I like that, right? But I don't particularly like the word. Um, retired, you know, some of us are retired, some of us are still working, and some of us never worked for, um, for a salary, and therefore we're not technically retired, so that word, word doesn't work. Rewired, a word that <laughs> Helen made up. Renewment, yeah, renewment is what Helen made up. Rewired is another word, seasoned. <laughs> Seasoned, I like that. I am definitely seasoned. <laughs> Sometimes not so tasty, but <laughs> still seasoned, right? Um, the actual one I like best is um, Laura Carstensen, who is the head of the um, uh, Stanford Center on Longevity. 
She uses the word perennial. And it's a nice image because as I understand gardening, you know, sometimes they have a good year, sometimes not such a good year, but you keep coming back every year, right? So, um, it's, I think that it's a real problem because if you can't name something, you can't see it. Many of us learned this a long time ago with the women's movement. So the challenge of what we call ourselves or reclaiming words that used to be negative and making them positive. I would like to celebrate the elders of my community for the wisdom that they have. Um, so it's a problem. So just out of curiosity, how many of you use the word senior for yourself? Raise your hand. So how many of you would choose that word? But keep that your hands up. Too. Any of you would choose that word, okay? How many of you like, I mean, what are, just yada, what are some of the other words that you use? Yes. Advanced maturity. Somebody said Altakaka. That's Yiddish for, uh, you know, a, 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 an old person. <laughs> what else? Other, I mean, it, it is a problem, right? If, you, if we could figure out how to, you know, active older adults is kind of the operative word. Um, any, any other thoughts? Yes? Amazing. Okay. <laughs> yeah? Classic. Classic. That's a good one. Okay. We have classic over here in suspenders. That's classic too, right? Yeah. Super senior. Over 90. By the way, it used to be that everybody who lived to be 100 would get a letter from the President of the United States. It doesn't happen anymore. <laughs> because so many people are becoming 100. And I read a statistic that a baby that is born now has a very significant chance of living to be beyond 100. So the world, the world is really changing and our we need to figure out ways to speak about it so that we can wrap our head around it. We have time for one last bit of our conversation, which is the book. Experience. I like experience. Experience. <laughs> um, the book. Reasons to write it, your inspiration to write it, and any comments about it. So here's the book. It's called Getting Good at Getting Older, and it is not a novel, <laughs> and it's not a sermon. There are lots of books now about growing older and making every moment count and all that kind of stuff. This is not that. This book is a toolkit, how we negotiate the issues that are part of our lives as we grow older. And for those of you who are Jewish, and who are roughly my age, you might recognize a book that was called The Jewish Catalog. Can anybody see that? How many of you know this book from when you were young? Can you just say a word about it, the you and the purple? What was your connection to the book? Okay, so, and anybody else? Yes? Also, it, yeah, for me, it told me about things that were Jewish that I didn't know about. So it turns out that this book was written in the late, it comes out of the late 60s, early 70s, it was published in 1973, and it was a toolkit. It was the first book that said, you don't need rabbis, you can take responsibility for your own Jewish life, and here are the tools. How do you make challah? How do you build a sukkah? How do you um, relate to Israel? How do you um, make a pilgrimage? Uh, specific kinds of questions 
that until that time, people needed authority. So this was, you know, don't trust anybody over 30 generation, right? It was a very significant book because it captured a moment in Jewish life. It turns out that that book was written by my late husband, Richard Seale. So that was the 60s and 70s, and now we were in our 60s and 70s, and Rich thought that we needed another toolkit for navigating the issues that come with growing older. Issues of changing relationships, issues of, um, I, you know, how to think about my body changing, issues related to end of life, how you plan a funeral, and this is a toolkit. And um, it's organized around getting good at gaining wisdom, getting good at getting better, getting good at giving away, get where we deal with issues of, of um, downsizing and thinking about legacy and all that, giving good at giving back, how people of our generation get involved in, in continuing to make the world a better place, um, and um, how we deal with living in the world of the sick. You know, so much of our lives are connected to people we love who are getting sick. Anyway, Richie and I wrote the book. Um, it was like a four-year process, two years into it, after actually he had written a chapter called Living in the Land of the Sick. He got diagnosed with cancer. He lived for two more years, and he rewrote the chapter as he was dying of cancer. So the book was published after he died, and it deals a little bit with how you deal with the loss. So that's the story of the book. It really is not a book that you read from beginning to end. You keep it on your night table, and when you have an issue that you need to deal with, you open it up, and it helps you do that. So I encourage you, people find it very useful, and I encourage you to stop over after we're done and have me sign it, and you take it home and read it. Do we have five more minutes on this for my timekeepers? So there's one. Yes, we have a few more minutes. So there's one other topic that I'd like to cover, and that's the subject of ritual. So we're moving into a long life stage with events happening that didn't happen in the past. And if I'm correct, you have um, embarked on a book and a very creative process to look at new rituals. Could you comment on that? So those of you that come from faith traditions know that there's a lot of ritual that happens when we're kids, but um, some of us then get married, and the next ritual after your wedding, at least in the Jewish community, is your funeral. Right? I'm going to live more years between my marriage and my funeral than I did between when I was born and when I first got married. What about all the moments in this stage of our life that deserve to be marked? What are those moments and how do we mark them? So that's the question um, and I think there's lots of different ways of thinking about it, but if transitions matter, and for some of us, ritual matters, you know, the tradition didn't have these rituals, or maybe you went through the rituals again with your own children and grandchildren, so you didn't need your own, but that only works if you have children and grandchildren, not all of us do. Uh, a side note, it's important to acknowledge that in this cohort of us, experienced, seasoned, creative, whoever we are, we're a cohort that has a lot in common, but we also are different. Some of us are married or partnered. Some of us are solo agers, a word that I never knew until after my husband died. Um, some of us are straight, some of us are LGBTQ, some of us have resources, some of us don't, some of us are differently able. You know, we're a very mixed group, and we need to acknowledge what we have in common, but also see each other and the truth of each other's lives. So what are the rituals that could mark that? Um, 
and because I'm connected to a faith community, how could a synagogue or a church or a mosque help us do that? So I'm going to just read very quickly a little piece from the other book that just is an example of a new kind of ritual. Saying goodbye to the house where you raised your children isn't easy, but it's easier if you actually say goodbye. Our daughter, this is a comment of mine, our, con our daughter, her boyfriend, my husband and I walked through the rooms of our home, stopping in each one to share good memories and to honor the room for its service. After our journey through time, space, and love, we shed a few tears, toasted the house, and sent it on its way to shelter and protect a new family. Before this ritual, we were stuck painfully holding on to the house we had built 27 years before when our daughter was born. But after the ritual, we felt joy and contentment as we realized how rich those years had been and how ready we were to let go and to move on. Years ago, I got a call from a woman on her way to clean out her parents' apartment after her parents had died. And she said, Rabbi, what's the prayer you say before you do that? And I said, yes, there should be a prayer. That would transform a chore into a sacred task. So that's the power of ritual. What are those moments? Is it retirement? Is it giving up the keys when you can't drive anymore? Is it moving to a new community? Is it um, whatever it is? Um, we need to begin to think about it. So this book that I'm working on is that. And I think it would be interesting for you all that are part of your village to imagine, you know, how do you welcome new people? People that have moved out here because their parents are here and eventually they're going to live here. What, what are the rituals of, of relocating? Um, all kinds of different questions. Um, and I'm curious to know what some of you think, because I'm writing this book, and I'm going to use your stories in the book. <laughs> so thank you in advance for your help. Well, thank you. Um, I think our conversation time is drawing to a close, but now we have, let me, did you want to talk about anything else? Only gratitude. <laughs> You're very welcome. Um, so we now have an opportunity for some questions and answers. You've got, I think, a piece of paper in your program. Um, if you need a pencil, raise your hand. We have pencil people. If anyone needs a pencil, raise your hand. Um, are there any questions? And if so, uh, write them down and they'll be collected. And uh, Rabbi Weber will answer them. I'm just curious, raise your hand if you have a question. So the thing is, does anyone have a question? How can you not have a question? Can we do it with your job? Uh, this is a really good one. And I, is aging, is ageism happening? when we consider our presidential contender. The Village is all about creating a sense of community for older adults living on the Palos Verdes Peninsula. We really strive to bring people together, help them feel connected, a sense of belonging to something bigger than themselves. We foster friendships while also offering opportunities for fun, engagement, fulfillment, and mutual support. I joined the PV Village in the fall of 2019 and enjoyed being with everyone so much, meeting new people. Uh, it wasn't too much longer than I became part of the program committee that arranges and coordinates all of our social activities, our educational activities, and it's all done with a com committee. Um, it's sort of biased for us when, when some one of the members wants a um, to do a particular activity. We see if we can get it going and bring it bring it to the fore. And it's been a wonderful experience for me. Uh, 
Isolation is not a thing that anybody wants to do at this point, is what I discovered, so. I've been a member for a very, very long time. And that's a good question about joining, because I was very thinking about, should I join this group or not, because I belong to so many groups, but it's been a win-win situation for me. You'll hear about all of the wonderful things that the Village does do. I try to get involved in almost every one of them. And that's not always possible. And Maria, there are some people here today who do not belong to the Village, and I think they're thinking of it. So let's hope that they'll do it. But you know, the Village has a lot of things to offer, things to do with books, exercise, meeting camaraderie. There's a lot of support systems going on. So to me, it's been a very good thing. I enjoy meeting with different people in different groups. I especially enjoy Tai Chi. We were able to start, start the Tai Chi like that, and we just had a really very nice trip up to the Reagan Library, so that was uh, a good addition to the village. Looking for more opportunities to have day trips. It's interesting, I think a lot of it's the state of mind. So we have members who are in their 90s who are still so active and engaged. They're active volunteers. They're volunteering 20, 30 hours a week. I mean, it's like a part-time staff person. A lot of um, people just want to stay in their own homes and they want to be as, as engaged as they can. So the village is great because we say, okay, what is it you want to do? We've got uh, something called Dining Around the World, which is each, every other month there's a theme. Like uh, October we had uh, German food and we, we do Italian food and Chinese food and, and just, you know, it's all potluck and it's all volunteer, it's in someone's home and we gather for that. There's educational opportunities. Um, one highlight is the uh, guided autobiography series of six classes where we gather and write our stories and the stories are, are themed. There's six or seven themes that people write about and then we sh share our stories. It's a wonderful way to get to know each other. And if you're writing something for your grandchildren, there you go. It's a different attitude and it's absolutely the best way to think about this time of your life. It's, the group is helpful, they provide information, and this is very, very good for all of us that are finding ourselves a little bit older. I'm interested in finding out if there really is any upside to aging. <laughs> And that will do it for today's show. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Maria Soreo, and we'll see you around the peninsula.